Okay, chapter, what is this? Chapter seven, metamorphic rocks. So here I have a little version of the rock cycle. Uh, I don't know if I put this in any of my previous um, video lectures, I, I can't remember, but hopefully now you've got a good idea of what the rock cycle is. This is kind of just basic, you know, sort of science stuff. Before you came into this class, you should have known this. But uh, just to remind you, you can get a any different rock type from the other rock types depending on what you do to it. So here we're going to look at metamorphic rocks and you get metamorphic rocks by metamorphosing any other rock, be it igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, or even other metamorphic rocks. So what is geological metamorphism? And if you think about, you know, the stuff you've uh, learned in the past and whenever we think about metamorphosis, we think about a a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, right? Well, this is kind of like that. So, with metamorphism and geology, uh, the name of the game is heat and pressure. Heat and pressure. Heat and pressure. There's reasons I went and found special fonts to put in this slide. Heat and pressure will give you metamorphic rocks. The rocks will recrystallize. Now it's not too much heat and pressure to where you actually melt things and go back and turn into a magma or a lava. Uh, it's just enough that things recrystallize. And how does that happen? You, well, your, your brain doesn't quite make sense of you, right? Like you're like, oh, how do things recrystallize without turning back into a liquid? How is that even possible? Well, strange things start to happen when you put uh, elements and compounds and, and matter in general under a lot of pressure. And this is one of those situations where you can actually get recrystallization if you have enough pressure and some heat. So what are we going to cover? So we'll talk about, again, if you remember from the previous rock types, texture and composition, right? Here it is again. But again, it means a little bit different for metamorphic rocks as it does for sedimentary rocks and igneous rocks. Remember, texture and composition in sedimentary rocks is more of, well, the composition is always kind of mineralogy, right? The composition is what what's the stuff made out of? What are the atoms? What are the minerals that make it up? And then texture in this case uh, is a little bit different. In sedimentary rocks, it's all about uh, the grain sizes, right? And in igneous rocks, it's kind of about the grain sizes, but also, you know, how crystalline is it? Is it crystalline or is it super microscopic? So here we talk about something that's a, a little bit different with, with texture. But again, their metamorphic rocks are classified by their texture and composition. So what factors affect the texture and composition of metamorphic rocks? We'll talk about the parent rocks of metamorphic rocks, which is what it sounds like. We'll talk about what temperature does and the different types of pressure, be it confining or differential pressure and then kind of how we classify them based on texture and composition, and then the different types of metamorphism we see, be it contact metamorphism or regional metamorphism. And the regional stuff uh, has a lot to do with uh, plate tectonics. So remember that. So, starting off. With metamorphism, we get recrystallization of the whatever rock is being metamorphosed and we get a change in composition. And what happens is the chemistry in that rock, our initial rock, our parent rock, will react with the minerals that are around it and we'll get a change. And we'll see a change in texture. The grains and crystals that are in, and you can say minerals, that are in that parent rock will end up getting bigger. And sometimes, under the right conditions, they will go through foliation, which means they'll get uh, elongated and aligned in one direction. And that's, this is a big part of, uh, of metamorphic rocks, this whole idea of foliation. And most of the metamorphic rocks we see have gone through this or have this feature. So a fun way to think about uh, metamorphic rocks and the parent rocks of metamorphic rocks is kind of to think about you know everyday things and how they will go through metamorphosis. Metamor yeah, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Ah, words. So oranges, right? You squish an orange and you get orange juice. So we can kind of say the parent uh, quote quote rock of uh, 
of orange juice would be an orange. And then if we take sugar and peanut butter and butter and chocolate and give it some heat, and we can kind of pretend we're giving it pressure, but we're giving it heat, what do you get? Delicious fudge. So the parent rock of fudge is something that's made up of uh, sugar and butter and all that, that other good stuff. So what are some of the parent rock features of metamorphic rocks? Well, if you have a parent rock that's made of quartz, like a quartz sandstone, you will end up with a metamorphic rock that's made of quartz. That's nice and simple. If you have a parent rock that's made of calcite, you know, like limestone's made of calcite, you will end up with a metamorphic rock that's made of calcite. And this is marble, by the way. Most other things, if you put them through metamorphosis or metamorphism, you'll end up with quartz. Why? Clays will end up turning into micas. And maybe there's some other stuff it could turn into, but a lot of cases, uh, clays will start to grow back as micas. And remember, with sedimentary rocks, everything weathers to clay, right? Or with uh, that weathering and erosion like, uh, chapter. Except for quartz. So when you metamorphose a clay enough, you can get a lot of stuff coming out of it, depending on what that chemistry uh, may be. But quartz is usually off on its its own. So basically what I'm getting at is clay and clays uh, don't have too much SiO2 in them. They don't really have any quartz in them because the quartz is just kind of off on its own. It's been separated out. But what about that quartz? Why do most other things recrystallize is quartz. Well, remember, we'll go back to igneous rocks. Remember this slide I showed. Remember, most things, most rocks, are made out of silica, the silicon dioxide. So if we just have a hodgepodge of whatever rocky material, and I decide to metamorphose it, or meta, yeah, metamorphose it, metamorphize it, whatever, uh, there's a lot of SiO2. So it's going to end up just growing back as a, uh, as a quartz crystal, right? So, yeah, that's why. Because most everything is made out of SiO2. So what does temperature have to do with all of this? Well, we know igneous rocks, and if you get things hot enough, what does it do? Well, it turns into lava, right? You get a rock hot enough, it, it melts. And then if you recrystallize that, if you melt something and then let it recrystallize, you've got an igneous rock. So if you get it too hot, we're, we're not dealing with metamorphic rocks anymore. We're dealing with igneous rocks. So something to remember. Pressure is the other side of the coin or the other piece of the pie or the other ingredient in the uh, 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 recipe. And there's a couple of different types of pressure, and I'll go through this pretty quickly because I don't normally test on this, but uh, maybe in the future I will, but right now I'm not testing on it. <clears throat> so there's confining pressure, and confining pressure is pressure that is applied equally on all sides. And that is similar to the type of pressure we will see in the ocean, right? If you go down in a pool and you go down to 10 feet or something, you can feel that pressure all around your head. And the neat thing with confining pressure is it will raise the melting point. It will raise the melting point. That means it makes it harder for something to melt because it raises the melting point. So it's got to get hotter to melt. This is kind of why, uh, if you remember back to our beginning stuff when we talked about the mantle, and I kind of tried to hit home that the mantle uh, is not, is not... Uh, molten. That's my little symbol for liquid. It's a little waves. It's not molten. It's actually kind of squishy and solid and plasticky. And that's because there's so much pressure in the mantle that the melting point of everything is raised. And so it's just difficult to get things to, to melt. Uh, another example of confining pressure. And I actually have a couple of these cups that I've got friends that work on ships like this. Uh, 
and they'll they'll take these styrofoam cups and they'll draw on them and they'll write your name and whatever. And they uh, they took them down in a submersible, not necessarily a person, but a submersible. And the styrofoam cup will shrink, but it shrinks on all sides. It's just a smaller version of itself because it's felt that confining pressure, pressure on all sides. Another type of pressure is differential pressure. Basically, it's different on different sides. You're getting greater force in one or two directions. So here, we have a pile of cars. Where's the direction of force here? Well, gravity's doing its work from the top, and then the ground is being resistant, and it's kind of pushing all these cars in this direction as they pile more and more and more and more on. Uh, the cars are getting nice and flat. So greater force in one direction. Uh, this happens with plate tectonics, right? We'll have two tectonic plates and they will be moving towards each other and that provides a lot of differential stress. And so the stuff that's in here in the middle ends up getting squished. And we have two types of differential pressure. There's just good old compressive where one thing pushed that way, the other thing pushed that way. So this is your compressive stress. You're pushing a, a dough ball in this direction. And then there's also this other type of force called shear stress. So here's compressive stress. We have a conglomerate here. Do you remember what a conglomerate is from sedimentary rocks? And it's getting compressed, right? So this used to be a conglomerate. This metamorphic rock here, this whole thing, the parent rock was a conglomerate that looked a lot like this. And it dealt with a lot of compressive stress and it got squish. And some of the stuff in the middle started to recrystallize. You see all this kind of black stuff around here? That's starting to turn into uh, micas like biotite. But the rest of this even started to recrystallize. This looks a lot like it's uh, recrystallized into the quartz a little bit. Even though they're these big grains of whatever it used to be, it may have been quartz, I don't know. Um, but it looks like it's turning into quartz now. But anyway, that's that uh, compressive differential stress. It will flatten bodies of rock. It is perpendicular to the stress, and we will find it at convergent plate boundaries. Where do we find differential pressure or compressive pressure? With metamorphic rocks, we find them at convergent plate boundaries, where plates are coming together. Remember this. Like I mentioned before, there's also shear stress. This will also flatten bodies of rock, but it's parallel to the stress. And we'll see this at subduction zones. Why? Well, when we have a plate that's being subducted underneath another plate, you'll see a lot of shear stress right here, kind of that side-by-side -side stress, and it will flatten things uh, as, as well. So it's fairly similar. So compressive and shear stress, aka differential pressure, will cause minerals to align, right? That's kind of what we've been looking at. Things get squished and they start to align. This creates a texture called foliation. So half the metamorphic rocks we look at are foliated. So here it is. This is a microscopic view. So here we've got some sort of igneous rock. How do I know? Because I can see all these little crystals and they're all interlocked together. You don't have to know that, but I know that. And then over here, same sort of rock, but it's been recrystallized. You can kind of see how everything sort of elongating in one direction, especially kind of in this this whole area right right here. So that's that foliation, at least as a seeing it as a micro under a microscope. So it resembles bedding, but it's not actually bedding. It's called foliation. And you will get platy minerals uh, that will grow and sort of uh, align with that foliation, which are the micas, muscovite and biotite, talc will also show up, and some other uh, micas as well. So again, 
Here we've got an igneous rock. Doesn't have to be igneous, can be sedimentary too. And then we're getting this, this up and down pressure and the minerals start to align themselves. So over here, plate of minerals like mica, and then we've got needle-like minerals like uh, amphiboles, which is hornblende. You get the idea. So let's actually look at some of them. So there are different degrees of foliation. There's kind of a, uh, a series of foliated metamorphic rocks. And to start off with, we'll look at slate. Slate looks a lot like shale. In fact, if you metamorphose a shale, you'll very quickly uh, get slate. And how do you tell the difference? Well, basically, slate is just, it's harder. It's not near, it won't break it and crumble in your hands as nearly as easily. It's not a dirty rock to handle. Um, when you go and look at shale, you'll, it'll kind of crumble in your hand and leave a mess in your hand. But slate, no, not so much. So slate will split into thin plates. And then there's schistosity. Can you say that? Schistosity. Be careful the way you say it. You might get in trouble. And with schistosity, uh, you'll see micas that are foliated, that are aligned. And you'll end up with a very shiny rock. So this schist is very shiny. It is schisty. It exhibits schistosity. Can you say that? But you can see, like, these are all little kind of crystals of muscovite and biotite in here. And then there's the third one, Nysic, where you'll end up kind of getting the light and dark minerals, and you're, you're, you're getting really close, getting back to kind of a granite at this point. Uh, you can see the feldspars in here. All this pink stuff is the feldspars. And then there's the darker minerals, uh, which are the micas and maybe some hornblends, but uh, definitely the biotites. So this is very characteristic of a nice. A lot of people will have this as their countertops, and they'll be like, look at my granite countertop. And I'm like, no. That's not a granite countertop. That is a nice countertop. And they look at me funny. And then I have to explain them about metamorphic rocks and everything you're learning right now. So foliation is a texture. It's pretty much the texture we care about with metamorphic rocks. It is exclusive to metamorphic rocks. We do not talk about foliation with other rock types. And again, it's caused by that differential stress, that squeezing. So how do we classify metamorphic rocks? Very simple. We have non-foliated metamorphic rocks and we have foliated metamorphic rocks. It's that simple. The non-foliated metamorphic rocks, we will name or sort of uh, define by what their composition is. A limestone metamorphoses into a marble because it's made of calcite. A quartz sandstone will metamorphose into quartzite because it's made of quartz. The foliated metamorphic rocks are classified and named based on how much foliation they've experienced, right? From a slate to a schist to a gneiss, and there's some stuff in between here too. There are different types of metamorphism. So now we're kind of going to talk about the environments in which these things form. Basically, there is an environment for the non-foliated minerals, and there's an environment for the foliated minerals. And by environment, I mean under the ground, not like a lake or something like that. Contact metamorphism happens locally, means it happens kind of in a small particular area. It is due to contact with magma or being very close to a magma because it basically gets cooked. It's a baked zone around magma. So I've got some magma body and next to that magma body, I've got rocks around it. And if it's too close to the magma, it'll provide enough heat that those rocks start to metamorphose. So they're already under a little bit of pressure being underground and just give them a little more heat and they'll start to metamorphose. And it's basically 
high temperature and pressure in this instance doesn't have much of a role because the pressure isn't really changing uh, it's just due to that extra heat that's added to the area and what's the texture non foliated because there's no squeezing right there's not that differential pressure so here's kind of what what you'll end up getting what it'll look like so take a second to uh, take this in it's actually a really good little diagram here we've got a little volcano up here it's got a magma chamber way deep down underneath it that's feeding the volcano and we've got different layers of of rocks here right so we're looking at a cross section from here to here and then at the top here it's a uh, it's a map right so this is our cross section shale when it gets too close to a magma when you have contact metamorphism contact metamorphism that's what we're talking about here shale will change into hornfells and right now in class we don't look at hornfells it's rather it's one of the most boring rocks you can actually look at it kind of looks like a, a basalt and it's kind of hard to tell apart from basalt sometimes but a quartz sandstone will metamorphose into a quartzite and then a limestone will metamorphose into a marble so if you have marble or you find quartzite you know it's most likely forming near a magma chamber which is kind of neat right that's that kind of uh, the stories that I talked about earlier in the semester so the the rocks are sort of the words of a story and if you know what they mean you can learn something about where they they came from well if I see a piece of quartzite in my hand or a piece of marble I know that I once had a limestone that was deposited in some shallow sea area and then later on it got buried and got close to magma which metamorphosed it into a marble kind of impressive so let's talk about the parent rocks of uh, metamorphic rocks that are caused by contact metamorphism so with the shale I give it some contact metamorphism I'll get a horn fills with the basalt I'll get a horn fills with a sandstone I'll get a quartzite Quartzite, by the way, looks like this, kind of a sugary rock and very, very, very hard. Uh, whenever I have to break, I, I dread ever having to break up quartzite because it takes a lot of hammering. Your standard little rock hammer really doesn't like breaking. It's not heavy duty enough to really break up a quartzite into large pieces. You really need a sledgehammer and eye protection. And even then you'll get shards that come off and uh, may potentially embed themselves in your skin. But very, very dense rock, very, very hard rock. Uh, if you remember in weathering and erosion chapter that showed some uh, uh, tombstones if you want a tombstone that lasts forever make it out of quartzite but good luck with that because it's so freaking hard so a limestone again with contact metamorphism will get a marble I've said this like three times now you might want to expect a quiz question on it Marble looks like this, kind of looks like the quartzite, but it's a lot softer. You put acid on it, it'll fizz just like calcite, uh, and it's great for making sculptures out of, right? Because it's a lot denser than your standard limestone. It's a little more uniform in what it looks like usually. Uh, and yeah. So what about regional metamorphism? Regional metamorphism, as opposed to contact metamorphism, is what most metamorphic rocks have gone through because it's so extensive. It happens over large areas because it's due to, what's it due to? I've already said it. What is it? Do you know? It's a larger area. Convergent plate boundaries, right? It's those two plates coming together and compressing and plates you know will extend for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles so you've got that huge boundary to where you can form uh, regional uh, metamorphic rocks or foliated metamorphic rocks so again you'll get that differential stress and differential pressure and the texture will end up being I just said it foliated So here's kind of a diagram. This is a cross section. If you don't know what a cross section is at this point, Google it real quick. I keep saying what cross section is, and if you haven't learned what that is, go figure it out because you're going to be too confused. Uh, so here we've got mountains at the top. There's a cooling off pluton here of magma that is now turning into what is probably a granite. 
Around here, you've got folded, and we'll talk about what folded rocks are, sedimentary rocks. So they're not metamorphosed yet. They're not deep enough. They're not hot enough, not under enough pressure. But as we go down, there's more and more pressure and more and more heat. And we'll see a, uh, this series of slate to phyllite to schist to more schist to gneiss. And then another one called migmatite, which is a rock that looks a lot like gneiss. It's just a little bit more metamor a little bit more metamorphosed. So with regional metamorphic rocks, what are the parent rocks? Well, with sandstone, we will also get quartzite. Imagine that. So even with contact metamorphism and regional metamorphism, we still get the same thing. Oop, oop, oop. And with limestone, same sort of thing, we will get uh, marble. Ooh, and earlier I said if I find a piece of marble or quartzite, that means it used to be a bivolcano. I was wrong. Hmm. Well, sometimes that happens. But now I'm correcting myself. You can get quartzite and marble from uh, regional metamorphism as well. So sandstone, it gets quartzite. Limestone, I'll get you marble. Shale or basalt with regional metamorphism, you will get that progressive metamorphic series. What do I mean by that? Well, with a shale, I metamorphose it a little bit. I'll get slate, which again looks like that. And in a rock outcrop, it looks like that. So it looks a lot like shale, just a little cleaner, a little bit blockier. After slate, I'll get phyllite, which is basically slate that looks a little bit shinier, but you can't really make out any actual crystals in it kind of looks like that. And from phyllite, we'll go to schist. So now those little shiny bits, which are micas, uh, have grown larger a little bit, and it just looks a lot like a uh, kind of a wavy piece of interlocked uh, muscovite and biotite. And sometimes in schists, you'll get other little crystals that start to grow in there, uh, most likely garnets. It's really common to see garnets. And from a schist, we'll get a nice. And a nice, is looking a lot more like a granite. It's a very hard rock. Uh, you'll see feldspars in it, and it's just not nearly as frail and, and shimmery as a schist is. And then from there, uh, you'll get a migmatite, which actually looks a lot like nice, and I don't test you on this, so don't worry too much about it. Here's another picture of it. And then if we metamorphose migmatite, uh, it's too much heat and pressure, you get a magma. So again, there's that series from slate to phyllite to schist to nice. These are the four I really want you to know. These are the four I'll ask you on a test question and I'll have a little multiple choice question. I'll say, put them in order of their uh, their amount of foliation or their amount of metamorphosis they've, they've gone through and experienced. And you'll say slate to phyllite to schist to nice. Cool? Cool. All right. That's all I've got for uh, for this one. Uh, typically, the lab rocks we look at, at least right now while I'm recording this, these are the, the metamorphic rocks we look at in the lab. This may change in the future. But again, there's that slate, the phyllite, the schist, the gneiss, and then the non-foliated quartzite and marble, and also coal. If we metamorphose coal, uh, there's kind of a series of grades of coal. Uh, and with sedimentary rocks, we look at bituminous coal, right? bit bituminous coal and if you metamorphose bituminous coal uh, you'll end up getting anthracitic coal or anthracite coal so that's all i got for this one let me know if you have any questions